Hello, I'm Ella Hepner, and today I'm going to be talking about Vloger. Uh, Vloger is a web app that I've been developing for the past couple of months, and it's essentially a visual interface for programming in ClojureScript. And what that means is that uh, Vloger gives you a kind of drag and drop interface for viewing and editing ClojureScript code, um, rather than a more traditional text-based uh, interface. Um, so the core feature of Vloger is a, a new strategy for visualizing EDN expressions that relies on a kind of nested circular structure rather than using text. Um, in addition to this visualization tool, Vloger also acts as a drag and drop tool for uh, editing these visualized EDN expressions. So Vloger's basic strategy for visualizing EDN relies on treating lists as circles and the elements of those lists as smaller circles with inside an enclosing circle. So here I have a couple of different lists as examples. Um, here we have an empty list, and in Vloger that just gets represented as an empty circle. Here we have a list of one element, and in Vloger that looks like a circle with a smaller circle inside. And here we have a list of three elements, and when there are multiple elements, uh, the first goes at the top of the enclosing circle, and the remainder get organized in a counterclockwise uh, pattern. Now the reason I went with a counterclockwise pattern rather than a clockwise pattern is that the, clockwise, or the counterclockwise pattern produces really nice and intuitive results when you're um, writing out a function call with uh, just a couple of arguments. Um, here we have some function calls uh, as an example. Here we have uh, increment being called on x, and you can see that the increment symbol uh, ends up at the top half of the enclosing circle and the arguments down in the bottom. Um, here we have a function call of two arguments, and you can see that, as always, the function call will be at top, um, and there, the uh, two arguments are down here in the bottom half of the circle. And the nice thing is that you can read them left to right. Um, if these were organized in a clockwise pattern instead, then this X would be on the right and this Y would be on the left. So you'd have to read it right to left, which would be really confusing. Um, here's an, uh, a function call of three arguments. And you can still kind of see that it's uh, a bit left to right. Um, but as the, the number of uh, arguments to a function call increases, it becomes kind of less and less obviously, uh, less and less obviously left to right. Like here, it's not even strictly left to right anymore. Um, you know, it kind of goes right to left uh, for the first couple of arguments. So you have to keep in mind that things are organized in a counterclockwise way. Um, now, one of the great things about Clojure is that uh, it supplements the normal Lisp syntax with uh, some new uh, types of forms that represent different built-in data structures. Um, for instance, we have vectors, which are represented by square brackets normally. And uh, in Vloger, those get represented as octagons. Um, whereas, you know, parentheses um, get translated into kind of smooth circles. Um, these pointy square brackets get translated into like a pointy octagon. Um, uh, Clojure also has maps, um, which are represented with curly braces. And in Vloger, uh, maps are represented as circles with little spikes coming out of each side, um, reminiscent of the spikes on the sides of the curly braces. Um, here we have function literals, which are not technically their own data type, but they do have special syntax in Clojure. And so in Vloger, that's uh, reflected by having a circle with little lines coming out, uh, out of each side. And uh, finally, we have sets, which syntactically are kind of like a combination between maps and function literals. And so in Vloger, these get represented as a circle that has both the, the spikes from the map and the lines from the uh, function literal. And uh, just like lists, uh, all the elements inside these structures um, get represented with the first element up top and the remainder in a counterclockwise order. Um, the real power of Vloger comes in that you can nest these shapes together inside one another. And by doing this, you can represent any EDN expression that you might want to, including ClojureScript code. Um, so here we have a, a little function definition, a function of one argument that takes, uh, or that takes in one argument and multiplies it by itself. Um, and in uh, Vloger, that would end up looking like this. We have the fn up here declaring that this is a function, our uh, argument vector here, and finally the function body where the argument gets multiplied by itself. Um, here we have another example of a closure script expression uh, calling the map B function on two arguments. Um, and here's what it looks like in Vloger. And you can see the, the function literal syntax um, fits in very nicely just to circle with these uh, lines came out of the side. And then you just use the, um, the normal percentage sign symbol inside to reference the, the argument. So at this point, I'm actually going to switch over to the app itself so you can see how it works. Um, here I have that expression that was uh, in that last slide, um, but there's a bunch of other stuff on the screen that I'll also explain. So one of the most important things on the screen is this uh, bottom right-hand corner right here, um, which is called the eval zone. And the idea of the eval zone is that it's basically like a REPL. 
um, any form that you see on the screen here, you can click and drag into the eval zone and it will evaluate it. I just clicked and dragged six, which obviously just evaluates to six. If I grab this vector here and evaluate it, then that will just evaluate to you know itself. Um, and if I grab this whole expression here with the map V and this function, um, then that will evaluate to the result of applying this function to these arguments, um, just like you'd expect. Um, you can also uh, edit programs by dragging things around in here. You know, if I wanted to uh, uh, like add a new uh, vector to um, to this uh, map V call, I could click and drag this, and it would get duplicated um, here. I can also change the order of things um, by clicking and dragging, and then uh, dragging the thing that I don't want anymore to the discard corner, which is down here. Um, this is how you discard things in Blogger. Um, and you can also drag things back out of the discard corner or out of the uh, eval zone. Um, anyways, that's it for the, disc uh, the discard corner and the eval zone. Um, up on the right hand uh, side of the screen, this might be obscured by my camera, but trust me, it's there. Um, there is a text button, and when you click on that, you will uh, see a page that has all of the code um, that you writ wrote on the previous screen um, displayed uh, in a text form like normal. So if you write something in Blogger um, and you, you're done with it and you want to pull it out and use it in some other, you know, Clojure script project, you can go in here to copy your code out. Um, on the sides of the screen, you'll see these form bars. Um, and form bars are basically just a place where you can store forms um, in a more long-term way um, that you might find useful in the future. So here I've got a bunch of different, um, you know, arithmetic uh, and function stuff here. I um, mean, I can drag any of these uh, out anywhere into my program uh, to use them whenever I feel like. Um, and these are completely dynamic, uh, meaning that any uh, any form you have in your code, you can just drag into the form bar and it'll stay there until you uh, d drag it to the discard corner to get rid of it. Um, so these form bars act as kind of like a combination of like a normal toolbar with some, uh, you know, tools on it that you can use to do stuff. Um, and also uh, like a clipboard, you know, you can use this as kind of a way to copy and paste stuff um, by, by dragging something onto the discord uh, or and onto a form bar, going to elsewhere in your program and then dragging it back out. Um, so now uh, I'll talk about these uh, tools that are up on the uh, top half of the screen or, and, and the bottom side. Um, we have the undo and redo tools, which you know are kind of self-explanatory. Um, here we have a tool that when you drag it onto a form, it encapsulates that form in a surrounding circle. And this is really useful if you want to you know, surround something with a, a, another function call, and that's uh, a great tool for that. And we have other tools here. Um, here's a tool that um, kind of takes something that uh, takes a form that you drag it onto and surrounds it in like a function definition. Um, so that's really useful too. Um, now let's go ahead and take a look at Vlogger's uh, settings. To get to the settings page, you just click on this little icon up here. Um, here on the main page of the settings, we have the project selector. Um, you can see all the different projects that you have in Vlogger. I just have this one right now. Um, you can make a new one by clicking this button. You can duplicate an existing one with this button. Um, you can delete programs with this button, and you can rename them with uh, this button. Um, over on the right side of the uh, of the main page, we have some various visual settings. You can change the the size of of kind of like the zoom level of your forms. Um, as you can see, uh, you can change the size of the form bars on the sides of the screen, um, including the tools. Um, and you can also change the camera speed, the speed at which you know you kind of jump around when clicking on stuff. Um, and then over here, there's also a couple of different uh, color schemes that you can choose from. But we'll stick with the default. Um, here we have the Saved Form Bars page. And the idea of this is that, um, like I mentioned uh, earlier, these form bars on the side of the page are, are uh, very dynamic um, and that you can kind of, uh, constantly kind of remove and add stuff to them, but that makes them kind of transient. Um, and so this Saved Form Bars page is a way to kind of store a form bar uh, that you like, that you think you might want to use in the future in a more long-term way. Um, like, say, if I really like all the features that I have on this form bar, I can drag that in here, and then at any time in the future, I can come back and that form bar will be saved right here. And this works like cross-project, too, so you can kind of transfer um, different form bars between different uh, projects. Um, here we have the Tools page, and this is where all of these tools that I was showing off before live. Um, there's all the ones that I showed and some, uh, some more. Here's one that encloses a form in a vector, uh, one that encloses a form in a let expression, etc. Um, and then additionally, uh, I'd like to show you that you can um, edit the positions of all of these form bars on the settings page. 
Um, if I grab one of these and drag it, then it will snap to uh, wherever I, I place it. Um, you can also create entirely new forms or more new form bars by clicking on these uh, circles. Um, these start out empty, but then if you go out uh, into the main program and start dragging stuff onto them, then you can fill them up with whatever you like. Um, you can also delete uh, form bars that you've created by dragging them into the uh, bottom left-hand corner. Um, and so all, uh, all of your, what you're seeing on the sides of the screen here is completely configurable. This isn't like fixed. Um, you can move these around, have whatever tools and whatever form bars you want. Um, so with that out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of write a little program in, Clo or in Loader so that you can see how it works in practice. And in particular, I'm going to write a little expression for determining whether some given number is uh, a prime number. So to start out, um, let me just create uh, an empty let expression, which I have in my form bar here, and I'll delete this, uh, this map call that we had earlier. So in this let expression, let's go ahead and define a binding uh, in, and that will be kind of the number that we're checking for primality. Let's set it to six, I guess. Um, and oh, one thing I didn't mention is that um, you, you're not just stuck at kind of this level of zoom. If you're kind of getting too deep to, to see things at this level, you can click on any form and zoom in to get more detail. Um, so here I'll click on this. And the way we're going to check for primality is by just checking every number less than n and seeing if it's divisible uh, or if n is divisible by it. So we're going to use the sum function to do that. Um, I'll use a function literal inside here. Um, and uh, what we're going to be checking is a, oops. Uh, we're going to be using the range function to get all the numbers between uh, 2 and n. We're starting at 2 because 1 doesn't really count when it comes to uh, prime numbers. And so inside this literal function here, we're going to check uh, if this um, if n is divisible by the current number. And so we'll do that by checking if uh, the mod of n with respect to the argument is uh, 0. And as you can see, uh, if there's some literal and you want to change uh, what it says, you can just click on it and uh, edit it at will. Um, so there is a little bit of kind of text editing involved in Blogger, but much, much less than in the normal Clojure script workflow. Um, so I think this should work. Let's go ahead and uh, run this expression. Oh, got an error there. Not sure what I did wrong. Mod in. Oh, there we go. That was supposed to be inside. All right. Now if I run this, um, then you'll see that it's telling me true for six. Um, it's actually giving the opposite uh, me the opposite answer of what I want here. It's checking whether this is not prime, not checking whether it is prime. Uh, so to fix that, I'll just wrap this form here in a not call, and then this should uh, this expression should be working. So here we have n of 6, and it tells us that 6 is not prime. If I change this to 7, then it will should tell us that it is. Yep, if we go to, say, another number, 14, uh, seems to be working. Yep. Um, and so if we wanted to change this into a function rather than just a let expression, we can just uh, get rid of that and change this to a function. And so now this is a function that takes in a number and determines whether or not it's prime. And you can see that that uh, you know evaluates to uh, kind of the function result that you'd expect. Um, we can also make this a named function just by kind of changing this and giving it a name. We can call it prime question mark, um, and that will also evaluate just fine. And then to prove that this works, let me go ahead and try to invoke this prime function and see what we get. So there's prime ten should be false. Yep, or prime twenty nine should be true, and it seems to be working. Um, so that's uh, the basic. Uh, that's a basic overview of what editing a program in Blozier looks like. Um, now at this point, I'm actually going to switch over to a local server um, rather than the production server because I'd like to show you a feature that isn't available on production yet that I'm still working on, um, and this feature is called Quill Mode. Um, so in uh, if if you're not familiar with Quill, it is a cross-platform uh, graphics library for Clojure and Clojure Script. Um, that leverages processing and P5.js for the JVM and JavaScript specifically. Um, and essentially, it just gives you a very nice, uh, simple, um, straightforward graphics library that you can use to draw animations in Clojure or ClojureScript. Um, and in this case, obviously, we're going to be using the, uh, the P5.js version that runs uh, in a browser. So to activate Quill Mode in this development branch, you uh, open up the settings. And on the uh, main project page, you'll see that there's this new uh, Quill Mode button. When you click on that, it will move a uh, loader off to just one side of the screen and create a new canvas here that uh, Quill can use to draw on. 
Um, so when you're in quill mode, there is a special function, uh, start sketch, that gets exposed by Vlogger. Um, and start sketch basically takes in a, a draw function and then draws uh, whatever that draw function says to draw on this canvas. And so we'll go ahead and run it to give you an example. Um, here we have just a black background with a red ellipse in the center. Um, and to see how this, uh, this animation is defined, we can zoom into this function here. Um, it's a function of two arguments, uh, W and H, representing the width and height of the canvas. Um, and all functions that uh, you pass to start sketch should take these, these two uh, arguments. Um, so the first thing that this function does is it calls Q slash background. And this Q namespace is actually the quill.core namespace, by the way, um, just something that, that uh, Vlogger automatically provides when you're in quill mode. Um, so here we have a Q slash background uh, called with zero. And that basically just tells Quill to set the, the whole uh, canvas here to black. Um, here we have Q slash no stroke, um, which basically tells it that we don't want any outline on the shape that we're about to draw. Here we have Q slash fill, uh, which we're using to tell it that the inside of the shape should be red. And then finally here we have the call to Q slash ellipse that um, actually draws the ellipse. Um, the first two arguments that it takes are um, an X and Y coordinate for the center of the, lip, uh, of the ellipse. Um, and we're getting those uh, x and y coordinate by multiplying the width and height um, that we're getting as an argument um, by 0 0.5, which places it in the center of the canvas. And then the remaining two arguments are um, the width and height, respectively. Um, so if I were to change any of this and then rerun this uh, start sketch expression, then it will um, update as you'd expect. Um, now, Quill is not just meant for drawing uh, static shapes. Um, it's meant primarily for animations. Um, but right now, you know, our draw our draw function does the same thing every time it's called, so this animation doesn't have any movement to it. Um, but if we want to introduce some state, then uh, we can uh, go ahead and uh, make this change over time. And to introduce some state, I'm going to use an atom uh, that will uh, change inside this uh, function call each time. And to do that, I'm going to use this tool here, which wraps a form in a let expression. I'll drag this onto Vlogger. And here you can see that uh, what was previously um, there is now in this uh, kind of body of the let expression, and we have a space to add bindings here. Um, so to, to uh, give our uh, image some animation, I'm going to define an atom called T. Um, and this atom uh, is going to just start out with a value of zero. Um, and one thing that I want to show off here is that when you're typing in a, in a literal uh, or in a symbol in uh, Vlogger, you can actually just write out full EDN expressions, and once you click out of that circle, uh, Vlogger will kind of translate it into the sub-hierarchy um, visual thing um, automatically. So, you know, rather than uh, dragging like a form for, for typing atom and stuff, or dragging in a circle and putting a, a smaller atom circle inside, I can just write out atom zero, um, and once I click out of that, it'll automatically get translated to this. Um, so Vlogger kind of allows for kind of a mix of sort of text-based and uh, visual programming styles. Um, so here we have t being initialized to uh, 0. Um, and inside this uh, function, um, we now need to uh, increment t uh, each time this function is called. And to do that, we will call the swap uh, function on t. And we will call it with uh, the increment function. So now uh, each time this uh, draw call is made, t will go up by 1. And to actually make uh, T do something, or to make our animation respond to T, we will use um, T in the definition of this ellipse here. Um, so for instance, we can make it so the, the width of the ellipse um, is equal to T. Um, and to do that, I can just write out at T. Um, in Vlogger, um, D references get represented as these little um, circles, this kind of little circle of circles. Um, so this circle of circles around T just re uh, reads as like at T, dereferencing de T. Um, and so with that, I think that we can go ahead and run this sketch again. And we should see that the uh, ellipse increases in size uh, as, as that runs, as you'd expect. Um, and so if you're familiar with Quill or any other graphics library, then I'm sure that you can see that with the tools uh, here, you could uh, create some very interesting and complex uh, animations. Um, but this uh, is enough to kind of give you an overview for the purposes of this talk. Um, so at this point, I'd like to switch back to my presentation. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and address the question of why somebody would ever be interested in using Vlogger over an existing ClojureScript workflow. Now, one of the big benefits of Vlogger is that it natively encourages, and in fact, kind of requires structural editing. 
Um, so structural editing is kind of this idea of editing Clojure or Clojure script code or really Lisp code in general in a way that kind of pays attention to its tree-based nature. You know, Lisp programs are really best thought of as these kind of nested tree structures rather than as pieces of text. Um, and when you're using a text-based editor and you want to do structural editing, you need all kinds of, you know, uh, text editor plugins and stuff to get your text editor to kind of pretend that you're editing a tree rather than editing text. Um, but in Vlozure, um, this is sort of a tree-first interface from the ground up. Um, so like, uh, like I was showing before, you interact with the program by just dragging whole forms around. You know, you're, you're never going to have a hanging parentheses or anything because uh, the, the structure that Vlozure gives you is just a direct representation of the, the tree structure of your program. Um, another benefit of Lozure is that it's meant uh, to be optimized for touchscreens. So right now, I'm mainly working on Lozure for uh, for web browsers, um, and there's no uh, like official mobile app or anything yet. Um, you can try the web uh, the web browser version on your phone, and it kind of works. But there are some significant uh, UX issues that I haven't uh, managed to solve yet. I'm kind of trying to work on getting the 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 basic like web browser version working before worrying about um, mobile compatibility. But from the very start, I've been designing Vlozure with the idea of eventually uh, porting it to, to mobile devices, um, because I think that this kind of drag and drop interface would be a, a really uh, powerful way to program on a, on a mobile device that would be way more powerful than any kind of uh, text editor on a mobile device. Um, so that is one uh, potential big advantage of Vlozure. Um, another uh, big hope that I have for Vlozure is that it can be used as an educational tool for beginners. And I think that there are a couple of things that can potentially make Vlozure more approachable for beginners than um, just kind of a normal ClojureScript environment. Um, there are a lot of other uh, visual programming environments like Scratch that just kind of use their own sort of made up programming language. But one of the great things about Vlozure is that if you were to learn uh, programming through a visual interface like Vlozure, then it translates directly to a real programming language, ClojureScript. You know, if you learn programming through Scratch, then you eventually have to realize like, oh, this, this language isn't uh, like, you know, something I can use to get a job or whatever, you know, this is, this is just kind of a toy. So I'm gonna have to give up this language and go learn something else. Um, but if you learn uh, programming via Vlozure, then you are just learning ClojureScript from the very start. You know, there's no point at which you have to say, okay, I'll have to give up on this language and go learn something new. Um, and so if you learned uh, ClojureScript through, through Vlozure, um, I expect that you'll have a very easy time kind of transitioning over to a normal Clojure or Clojure script workflow um, once you've learned with Clojure. Um, because once you kind of understand how to translate between the, the text representation of stuff and the, the Vlozure representation, um, it's just completely the same language. Um, another uh, benefit for beginners is that, like I said, there's no way to have a hanging parentheses or anything. Um, Vlozure forces you to have valid syntax. There's no way to, uh, you know, um, produce a syntactically invalid program in Vlozure. Um, and additionally, uh, for people who are, uh, already know um, some programming languages, oftentimes when they look at Lisps, they'll say, there are so many parentheses here, this looks so ugly. Um, and once you understand the syntax of Lisp, you realize that that kind of simplicity of just having uh, parentheses and stuff um, gives you a lot of power um, in that it makes uh, the, the program so kind of easily uh, amenable to like analysis, which allows for things like, uh, like structural editing and, uh, and metaprogramming in the form of macros. Um, and so uh, an interface like Vlozure can allow you to enjoy all those benefits of lists, but without seeing any parentheses at all, right? There were very few parentheses listed during this talk, even though I was just programming in ClojureScript, right? The, the parentheses just get translated to circles. And so somebody can look at a, a, a bit of Lisp code and not even uh, have to worry about uh, all the parentheses. So that won't scare people off anymore if you're using Vlozure. Um, there's also some significant limitations with Vlozure as it exists right now. And one of the biggest uh, limitations uh, in principle is the information density of uh, the code that you're seeing. Um, so one thing that's great about text-based uh, uh, interfaces is that uh, you can see a lot of text on a screen at once. Uh, if you have, you know, a reasonable zoom level. Um, in Vlozure, it's hard to see more than like three layers deep into a hierarchy without the text becoming so small that it's like impossible to read. Now, thankfully, Vlozure makes it very easy to kind of jump around in a hierarchy and zoom to different levels. Um, and so if you're if you're like actively clicking around or, or tapping around, um, then the, the information uh, density problem is solved to some extent. But if you're just looking at like a static screen, then you can't see as much code at once with Vlozure as you could with a text-based interface. 
Um, another limitation with Flojure right now is that it doesn't really do much in the way of uh, handling errors. Um, when an error happens in your Flojure script code, oftentimes it'll just crash the, the Flojure web app itself. Um, and even when that doesn't happen, you know, it might just fail silently and not really give you uh, any kind of useful information. Um, eventually, I do plan to fix this. I plan to add some more tools for kind of exploring uh, Clojure uh, errors in a visual way. Um, but right now, um, Lojure doesn't really have any way to do that. The only way to, to see what's gone wrong when, you know, your, your code crashes is to look at the, the development console. And even then, um, the, the results that it produces can be kind of hard to understand given that it's operating in a bootstrapped environment. Um, and another big limitation of Lojure is that right now there's not really any way to use it on an existing code base. You know, Vlojure just lives as a web app. And if you want to, uh, you know, edit something in Vlojure, you'd have to copy all your code into this web app and then copy it back out when you're done, which obviously isn't very practical. Um, I'd like to also address this limitation, um, usage on existing code bases, by eventually making a, um, a, a port of um, Vlojure that works as kind of like an in-repl plugin. Um, and there's a project called Gorilla Repl that I'm uh, aiming to base this off of that uses a, or that creates kind of a web, uh, a web browser-based interface um, as a uh, kind of REPL for um, a running like JVM uh, Clojure project. And so in, in the future, I'd like to eventually develop something like that for Vlojure as well. Um, so anyways, that's my talk. Thank you for listening. Um, here's my contact information if you'd like to get in touch with me. And I hope that you find Vlojure useful or at least interesting. Thank you. Thank you.